Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Rendezvous, a program on holiness and growing in the love of Jesus that was created by our friend Dr. Rhonda Chervin. My name is Louise Walkup, and I'm the moderator for today's program. On our panel today are Maria Smith, Dave Basconi, and our newest panelist, Brenda Peter, whom we had introduced to you last week. We're all friends of Dr. Rhonda, and we're all trying to grow in love and holiness. We explore the topic of love and holiness each week, by discussing one chapter of a book written or edited by Dr. Rhonda. And good news, too. Rhonda may be with us next week, uh, so please say a prayer um, that she'll join us on our radio program. Uh, As you know, we're currently discussing Rhonda's little book or booklet called Give Me Your Heart, Preparing for Eternal Life. And this book contains excerpts from the writings of Charles Rich. And you can get this booklet for yourself free of charge from Rhonda's website, www.rondachervin.com. And when you're there, just click on books and a listing of all her many outstanding free ebooks appear as you scroll down the page. And that's one thing I've always loved about Dr. Rhonda. She wants what she came up with in her books to be available for everybody. She's not looking to be a multimillionaire, but she just wants to spread the word, bring some good, and help people. That's, that's in her blood and in her DNA. So the book that we're discussing today is a compilation of marvelous quotations on spirituality by Charles Rich that Rhonda organized alphabetically in chapters by topic. For example, lonely, rebellious, worried, longings of the human heart, grief, etc. So if you're experiencing any of these emotions, you can just scroll down to that chapter and discover some helpful gems. So let's begin with prayer. (coughs) Dear Lord, we ask you to pour your blessings on Dr. Rhonda and her family and on our wonderful listeners and on our panel. Holy Spirit, inspire us with thoughts that will help all of us grow in love and holiness. And we ask dear Charles Rich, who's smiling at us from heaven, to pray for all of us and to help us grow in the love of Jesus while we meditate upon and discuss his writings. And last week, uh, we, we entered on the topic of doubtful, Uh, the same topic on which we'll begin this week, and then we'll move on to the chapter in the book entitled Exhausted. In Rhonda's tradition, we begin the program by just saying a little bit about the individual we're discussing, and in this case, Charles Rich. And in the month of November, a lot of us, especially in the Catholic tradition, we think of the departed We think of those that are really sick. We think of purgatory. We think of those that will not be with us much longer. And um, in November, I can't help but think of Charles, because even though he's not here on earth, and I'm I'm pretty sure he's not in purgatory, he was eager to go to heaven for the last 60 years of his life. He just couldn't go. Uh, He just couldn't wait to get there, and he prepared himself for heaven every day. And um, that's why Rhonda entitled her biography of him, Hungry for Heaven. He lived to the ripe old age of 99 and was wondering, why, Lord, why am I still here? So um, as I I think of him, as I think of the elderly in their 90s in this month of November, um, in this month I also think especially of my mom. She turned 90 over the weekend, and she's, she's just a good role model for me. She's active, and she's busy, and she tells me never to stop doing anything because it's hard to resume a practice once you stop. So anyway, after the aside of my mom, I'd like to um, open uh, with a quote on, by Charles Rich 
from the very last chapter, or the last paragraph, too, of the biography Rhonda wrote, um, Hungry for Heaven. And um, this quote is four sentences long, and it's from a communication Charles wrote to Rhonda, so you'll see her name in the quotation. And this is how he describes his longing for death. I feel myself being drawn out of this life to approach the place I want to be so much in heaven. How delightfully excited I become as I realize that as the result of my age, I shall soon be with God in that state of glory and how sorry I feel for all those who are still going to remain in the present life. Just think, dear Rhonda, just think. I shall soon see not only beautiful things, but him who is the very source and origin from whence all beautiful things have the beauty they do. I think of this, and as I do, so I am thrilled in my inner being, close quote. So uh, the, uh, that is the paragraph which, which um, Dr. Rhonda closes her biography on Charles. And he was just saying that he was really eager, he was hungry, and he was, uh, quote, he was starved, uh, unquote, to get to heaven. That's, that's where he wanted to be. And uh, I, I like to think about that because I... Um, I have things I'd like to do. I'm not quite, I'm not quite longing to go to heaven yet, right away. But if God would want me to go, if God would want my life to end today, of course that's what I would want too. But in the back of my head, I have things that I'd like to do, and I think of what a blessing it is for all of us who have something on our to-do list every day that we do have things that that we'd like to do, and. Um, that it's just a blessing that we have something to get up for, something to work for, something to to move towards to, and and that uh, that God gives us through the Holy Spirit the the ability to discern what we should be doing. So, so those are the thoughts on my mind this November morning, as as it is the month of the Holy Souls in Purgatory, and as we think about all of the people that we loved uh, that are um, that have passed away. And that are hopefully in heaven, and um, and we pray for all of them to bring them to a greater glory in heaven, whether they're in purgatory or not. The prayers we say for them will give them greater intercessory power and a greater intimacy with God. So God uses all our prayers, and we we should never ever ever stop praying. Um, okay, so um, before I ramble on for the rest of the show here, Maria, would you like to um, open the program with thoughts that came to your mind this week or um, uh, we were finishing doubtful and going on too exhausted? Um, what would you like to share with us? Well, continuing to share to talk, speak about heaven, um, there's one thing that's been going on for a long time, I know, for probably decades, is that people don't really think that um, there's a hell. People, or if, they, if there is a hell, they don't really give it much thought. Instead, they are of the opinion that they themselves and just about everybody else, if not everybody else, will be going to heaven. And this is even um, brought about by certain people on, in videos or in um, articles and from when I first heard of this years ago, I thought it can't be right that most people are be going going to heaven or nearly all or everybody. Although we need to pray for everybody to go to heaven, we need to long for it because that's what God He creates. God creates everybody, every single soul for heaven. He gives every single person a chance, the opportunity to get to heaven. And yet, I do believe that many people refuse this gift, refuse this opportunity, day after day, month after month, year after year. And we really need to get back to talking more as lay people um, in our parishes and the priests and bishops, speaking about the reality of hell and how difficult it is to get to heaven and how easy it is to go to hell. 
if we so choose to. It is our choice, but the easy choice is to take the easy way. And there are numerous, numerous parts in the Bible where Jesus tells us about the reality of hell and how difficult it is to get to heaven. The way to heaven is narrow and difficult. The way to hell is easy and wide. And then I've been reading, I've been listening to St. Faustina's book, her diary, and she mentions it, that, you know, she had a vision of so many people dancing and being happy on this road, and they come to a cliff, an abyss, and they fall down. And then there's the other road where people are stumbling, and it's a difficult, rocky road, and then they enter into a beautiful garden, and they forget all their sufferings, which is really heaven and hell. So Charles Rich speaks a great deal about heaven, and um, one of the quotes that I have by Charles Rich is, it's hard to talk of heaven while still on earth, and yet glimpses of its bliss continue to find their way into our weary, laden lives. And heaven is total bliss, but we have to really want it. And if we really want it, we're going to put our lives and our wills in conformity with Christ. And it's not an easy thing. It's the most difficult thing in the world for each and every human being to do, to deny themselves and to give their lives and their wills to God. Excellent point. Uh, Dave and Brenda, do you have comments on, uh, on Maria's comments? Well, I just think you're right on, Maria. Uh, I think our culture has uh, made it easy for us to forget the hard things and because we're told how great life uh, can be, should be. Uh, you know, you deserve this, uh, you deserve that. So I think that constant bombardment of, uh, you know, all the pleasures uh, just tends to push out the the bad things and hell being one of them. Yeah, good point. And Brenda, do you have any comments you'd like to share on that topic? I think what Dave says is really accurate. I was thinking about how it's not just this idea of hell, but it's the fact that, you know, what you believe is what you live. So... If you um, don't have this idea that there are these distinct places, and especially in regard to hell, being a real place and a real possibility, that shapes your entire life. And it shapes every single thing you do. It shapes your actions. And when we look at this culture, you know, even if we don't know per se that people don't believe in hell, the culture shines that forth constantly, 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 just because of the preference for pleasure in all things and uh, never seeing any good whatsoever in suffering and sacrifice. And so, yeah, it definitely is pretty evident. And then this is where our pastors really, really need to stand up this is when we need to hear. We need leadership. You know, we need fatherhood. We need, pa- we need pastors who are true, true fathers. When we talk about pastoral, priests being pastoral, that's really what it is. For pastors to be fathers, you know, we need to be told what to do, especially when we're being foolish. We need to be told what to do. And we need our pastors to be talking about these things seriously as part of their homilies and really getting back to the, you know, very unpopular topic of the last four things. You know, the last four things should be something that is talked about very, very often, you know, at least at a minimum once a year, but very often, Mm -hmm. you know, so so it's a shame. It's really, really a shame, and it's, uh, you know, sometimes I know for us it's just painful to, For us here who all see this, it's painful to even think about it, that so many souls are being lost and because of of people, pastors, people in positions of authority not speaking out about it. You know what happens also is that I've heard if if we don't really speak about hell and really don't understand the reality of hell, is we lose our zeal. I mean, it's like, well... You know, those people, they're doing pretty well. They don't, they're not going to church. They're not believers. But, you know, they're honest. They work hard. What is the zeal? What is the, what is the urgency of really trying to reach out to other people? If, you know, just about everybody or everybody has a reasonable hope of getting to heaven, there's really no sense in really 
our, denying ourselves or trying to, trying to reach out to others to help them to understand what, what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah, That's no. a good point, and there, with an urgency to reach out. I, I, I myself, I, I can't uh, follow the Ignatian suggestion that we think seriously and strongly about hell. I just find it too, too creepy, too scary, but that's what I'm supposed to do to, um, uh, to grow in holiness, just to realize what hell is in contrast to heaven, but, but I haven't gotten to that point of thinking of it yet. But on the other hand, just to know that so many, so many of us uh, risk going to hell, one-third of the angels, it's believed, fell and went to hell, it makes us wonder how, what percentage of the people will go to hell. And, and when we think that it's eternal and when we think of those that we love and our families and those close to us and that work with us um, that are in particular um, close danger on, on the type wrote, uh, the word urgent that you mentioned, Maria, is, is right there, that it's really urgent that we pray every day. Yes. And prayer is not optional for any of us. Prayer, uh, prayer and sanctity go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other, as far as I understand. Right. But, you know, yeah. if, if, if we're all, if we, there's a reasonable hope that everybody will get to heaven. Why even pray all, all the time? Why really um, spend that time and energy to, to pray? Why practice the presence of God? Why do all these things? And the other thing I wanted to say, too, was, you know, if there's a reasonable hope that everybody's going to get to heaven and we really don't have to work that hard at it, it really makes the Bible, especially the New Testament, a lie. Think about St. Paul. Think about what St. Paul went through for Christ. Most of us don't do that. He, I mean, he was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was, oh, my goodness. And he was, and he was um, killed. He was, his head was cut off. And yet, he says he worked out his salvation in fear and trembling. Well said. Very well said. And, um, and Davis, we, we move on. We have like 13 minutes left in the program. Did you have, I think you wanted to start by continuing with the idea of doubtful that we were talking about last week. Well, it's not a quote from Doubtful, but it could, I think. An uh, idea, uh, yes, an idea yeah, that uh, rubs off of it, yes. Yeah, and uh, I was uh, recently in a bookstore at a monastery when I heard the following. Um, the teacher is quiet during the test. And um, I thought that was pretty good because I started mm. thinking back to my school days, and the teacher prepared us for the test, then was quiet during the test. And I think our faith works the same way. God prepares us for the test, then is sometimes quiet during our trials. Um, oh. now that, does not, that does not mean he has abandoned us. It's just that we need to rely on our faith and grow in it by going through the test that we have been prepared for. So mm. I, I tell you, it was just... Uh, it, it oh, was I like just, that. Yeah, and it was just by chance. I was actually headed out the door, and when I heard that, uh, there was a woman talking to a gentleman uh, about some things, and uh, so if I had, you know, 30 seconds later, I would have missed it, but I, that really got me thinking about, you know, why God is sometimes quiet. It's, we are being, te we've been prepared, but now mm. we're going through the test. And this is a chance for us to grow. And it just puts That's a whole beautiful. different light on how, how we should, you know, react to things like that, I think. And silence is so important. It's a, 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 something that's not thought of today because we're bombarded with, with sounds and, and, and words and YouTube and uh, music, whatever. But we, we need silence in order to hear God, what God is telling us during the test. Mother Angelica used to go pray two hours before each of her programs when she started on on TV. She she, she was in, in silence where, where she could hear God. But I, I love that right during the test, God is quiet because he prepared us ahead of time. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. lo that's a lovely thought. I oh, really like that. Beautiful. Yeah. And Brenda, did you have a, 
a particular topic you wanted to bring in mind or a quote for us? I well, I was looking at exhausted, and I um, the one that stood out. Several things stood out to me, but the one I think that just struck me more personally is um, when he says, "I thought this was a really bold statement, mm-hmm. but I thought it was something that I think people, especially in our culture." Um, and like so many statements, it's very nuanced. You have to think about it in a certain way. But I think people, especially in our culture, um, could heed. Um, and I, I would say, honestly, a lot of even um, faithful Catholic people, it's train yourself not to take on responsibilities that are not necessary. And so that was just very like weighty to me. Um, train yourself not to take on responsibilities that are not necessary. So one of those statements that you could just ponder, you know, all day long. And on the one hand, when you look at our culture, a lot of people don't take on responsibilities that are necessary, like, for instance, when they have an abortion. So, you know, if you have this child and they don't want to take on that responsibility, that actually is necessary, you know, because Mm. now that that child's been created, that is a necessary responsibility. Now, of course, if somebody truly is not up to the task, then they have the opportunity of putting the child up for adoption. So that's another, you know, another point. But this idea of necessary and really looking at your life like, you know, that examined life where you really look at your life and you say, well, what are the responsibilities in my life that are actually necessary? And I think, um, you know, I'm thinking of a a friend who actually is having surgery today, um, so she's really on my mind. And it's it's sad to see her as an elderly, an older Catholic woman so overwhelmed by the responsibilities in life and just feeling so weighted down by it. And I I believe that she loves Jesus very much, but yet she doesn't really know how to go to him and ask him to relieve her burdens in this life. So that being with her is really painful. Having conversations with her can be quite painful because she is just so stressed out. This stress just exudes from her being. And I know for myself, it's really taken a ton of discipline to keep life simple. And I think in this culture, again, with all the distractions and material goods and entertainment opportunities, you know, it's, it's, I mean, even in the Catholic world, as we know, you know, you could be listening to some of the best Catholic books, the classics online, the audio versions, you know, 24-7, if you live to be 500 years old, you probably wouldn't even scratch the surface <laughs> of what's available. <laughs> yeah, and, good you know, point, yeah. How you have to be, like, unbelievably disciplined, and you need to just say no. And, you know, my poor friend has a house here in the United States. She has a house in another country where she is from, and she really is so overwhelmed by the burdens of them that I just see her not enjoying life. And I think of somebody like Charles Rich, but I even have my own grandparents who um, unfortunately were not very devout, but they were very simple. And I see myself going into those years and thinking about how, My prayer is that my life, as I get older, is much more simple. And when you're not raising your children and having those same responsibilities, let's say, to maintain a house or whatever, and I want to really be able to be present to everyone in my life and be in the moment and enjoy them and and really savor. And Charles Rich's life, that's really what his life represents to me is that he was able to be present in every single moment. And a big part of it was not taking on unnecessary responsibilities. Oh, that's well said. When you spoke of abortion, you reminded me of a conversation we had on the radio before the show started that Maria had uh, had brought up about how abortion is such an important issue in our culture and that many times, uh, Catholics are not distinguished from Protestants or other religions by uh, by their view uh, by 
by the importance they put on abortion and elections. Um, we've got like five minutes left to the program. Maria, did you want to say a few sentences about what you said before the program on on, on abortion in our country and the political climate? Sure, yes. There's a video that I watched just recently, and it is called, it's on YouTube, it is called Why Do Catholics Vote Democrat? And then colon, Against Catholic Socialism. So it's with Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon. If you put in Why Do Catholics Vote Democrat? Taylor Marshall, it will show up on YouTube. And it is excellent. And they speak about they speak about the encyclicals that several popes have written, um, Rerum Novarum and um, Quadragesimo Annus and Centesimus Annus by Pope John Paul II. The first one was Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and the second one 40 years after. And they all revolve around socialism and how that is not, Catholic. You can't be a Catholic socialist. You just can't. And they say it. And I think it was Pope John the Twenty Third, and that Taylor Marshall said he just said it clearly. You cannot be a Catholic socialist. The two cannot go together. And they speak about the, the abortion issue. You cannot do that. And all those who are voting Democrat need to know, need to understand what the Democrats are really working for. And there are no. There are, at this point, what Taylor Marshall said, in any of the major offices, there are no Democrats who are pro-life. None. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, we've got like three and a half minutes before we close. Um, uh, uh, Dave and Brenda and Maria, too, do you have um, a few comments you'd like to share before we, we close? I wouldn't buy so uh, fast. <laughs> The uh, earlier when we were talking about white people don't uh, think there's a hell. I, I can tell you, back in my early days uh, when I was very young, uh, I was familiar with the Protestant approach, the preachers, and they were known for their fire and brimstone uh, sermons. Uh, you know, boy, they they laid it out. Uh, if you didn't, you know, get your life right, you were going to hell, and. Um, I don't know if that's still the case in Protestant churches, but it sure was back in the uh, early to mid '60s. And um, I, I think uh, you know that subject does need to be talked about far more, uh, you know, in the homilies that we hear. Um, you know, it was it kind of reminded me of the church uh, sexual abuse scandal. It was it's been talked about more now. I've heard it like almost every Sunday in some form or another since the two-by-four uh, hit the forehead, you know, a couple months back. And I, I sometimes think it, it takes something like that to get people to wake up and start to talk about it. So um, that's, just my, uh, that's just my take on that. Oh, I didn't realize you you were not raised Catholic, Dave. Is that right? No, 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 no. I was raised. I've always been Catholic. It's just that oh. where I grew up, it was so rural. There were no Catholic churches. And oh. So for, so for a couple of years, I went with my neighbor to a Protestant church. Just to, my mother just thought we needed religion in our life. Then, as soon as a missionary Catholic church showed up, we we were Catholic. No, I've always been Catholic. It's just we didn't have one in close enough because of where I grew up. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very good. And yeah, Brenda, it might get – I'm Maria? sorry, Louise. I just was going to say to Dave, it might get that way again, right, Dave? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> yeah, it seems like you're talking about today, Dave, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and we have a, a minute and a half left. Any other comments before we say a quick prayer? Sure. Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, we thank you again for this time together. Uh, thank you for letting us think about you, think about uh, the last things, uh, think about the reality of hell, the urgency of, of prayer, the necessity to be good, to love, to, to set time aside for you, the necessity to prioritize our needs, what's important. And um, if necessary, to drop some things if we have to add some other things. So help us discern to do the right things. Let us always feel your presence. And um, 
let us be strengthened by by being as faithful in prayer as we can, by, by fasting and by sacrifice. All of these are wings of the dove that bring our petitions, our hopes, our dreams, and our wishes up to heaven to our, our dear Lord. And Charles, pray for us throughout the week until we get together again. And we, we thank you. Uh, goodbye. And, and in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Have a good week. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. you. Goodbye. God thank bless you. Everybody. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.